We've looked at why people migrate, and we've looked at the patterns of their migrations, and now let's put a nice gaudy bow on this unit and talk about the effects of migration. It's a juicy one, so if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. So let's begin with the political effects of migration, and we'll consider those effects both on the migrants' location of origin and their destination. So first, migration can affect the balance of political power within a country, as it did in the Sun Belt migration in the United States from about 1950 to 1980. And for various reasons, most notably people looking for jobs, a mass migration occurred from these regions to this region, which is known as the Sun Belt region. And as it turns out, all these folks up here were getting a little tired of living through winters that were colder than a penguin's armpit, and thanks to new transportation infrastructure like the interstate highway system and the widespread adoption of air conditioning and houses built in the hot south, people began migrating in droves. Now, I don't just mention this for poops and giggles. This mass migration had serious political consequences. Because political power in the U.S. Congress and, more to the point, the House of Representatives is based on population, political power began to shift to the more populous states. And that meant that the states of origin lost political power while the destination states gained political power. Okay, now another political consequence of migration is the introduction of immigration laws, otherwise known as immigration quotas. I mean, I hate to be the one to tell you, but when large numbers of immigrants arrive in a country, it can make some native-born people a little twitchy. Now, this happened in the second half of the 19th century here in the United States with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. With a huge number of Chinese immigrants showing up looking for work in the railroad industry on the West Coast, native-born Americans began to seriously resent them, not only because they were filling a lot of the jobs, but also also because they were culturally different. And so the U.S. Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which essentially cut off all Chinese immigration for a decade. And this affected these immigrants' origin country by restricting the opportunities for jobs available to them, and it affected their destination country by removing valuable labor from industrial railroad projects. Okay, now let's consider the economic effects of migration. As we've said before, the need for work is often one of the chief motivators of migration, and Ravenstein even said so in his Laws of Migration. Anyway, destination countries benefit from immigration because immigrants often come seeking work. Additionally, they will often accept jobs at lower wages in sectors that native-born people are less willing to hold jobs, and today agriculture and construction are significant examples. And for countries with aging populations whose workforce is beginning to shrink, this can be a uh, real help. For After all, somebody's got to pay for grandpappy's social security. But the economic effects can also be felt in migrants' countries of origin. If migrants are leaving to look for work, that means that the jobs that they left, if they had them, are now opened up for others who need them. However, if there aren't enough people to fill those jobs those folks left behind, then that country's economy might begin to slow down, and that is no good. But another economic effect of immigration comes in the form of remittances, which is money sent back to the country of origin. In general, when people migrate to find work, they seek jobs that pay higher wages than they could earn in their place of origin. And often they send money back to their family to help improve their standard of living. And remittances make up no small chunk of various economies throughout the world. In fact, the World Bank, who tracks these numbers, reports that in 2022, something like $766 billion in remittances were transferred between immigrants and their families, to which I say, dang. And finally, let's consider the cultural effects of migration. In the destination countries, one major cultural effect of migration is the introduction of the immigrant's culture, which includes their language and their religion and their food, etc. Like, let me ask you a question. If you're watching this, you are likely in high school, and that means you're required to take a foreign language. So, which language are you learning, or which one do you plan to learn? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and bet that your answer is Spanish, because about 75% of American high school students choose to learn that language. And why? Well, a big reason is because the largest portion of the immigrant population in America is Spanish-speaking, and that has had an enormous effect even on our education system, to which I say, bueno. But in terms of the location of origin, the cultural effects of migration can be felt in various ways as well. Because of the prevalence of remittances, families left behind in the country of origin can often improve their standard of living. But on the downside, family structures can be strained and broken apart when one of the parents, usually the father, departs to go look for work elsewhere. All right, since this is the end of the unit, you might want to click here and grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. Also, you can click here to check out my other unit two videos. I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.